Welcome everyone to Kickstart webinar number six, using simple rules to make better trading decisions. It's great to have you all here. Thank you for coming out. I think this is going to be a really powerful webinar, um, so I'm glad you're here to have it. We are recording this, so if you need to jet or um, want to review it, we'll have the uh, recording posted later today. Also, as a quick reminder, we also have a webinar at 4.30 p.m. Eastern today. That will be with me, although Jim may jump in, um, for accessing content at the member and training sites. So if you'd like more information, and we can talk about specific content in terms of topics and the trading process, and I'll answer any questions that you have or hear any comments that you'd like to make. So um, that is posted at jdaltontrading.com under webinars, upcoming webinars. So again, thank you everyone for being here. I hope you enjoy this. We hope you enjoy it. And I'll turn it over to Jim. Hey, Jim. Julia, do you have a picture? I, I sent you that picture of that chair under the tree. Do you have that? Uh, you put it through my phone, so give me a second and I'll um, I'll get it. I thought we'd show people where this, uh, my office and where, uh, where this whole thing was created. <laughs> okay. Uh, so if you find that, put it up. But meanwhile, I'll, I'll just go ahead and, and get started. The um, simplifying both the learning and trading decision-making process. Uh, as I put on the slide, and I spelled most of the things out, but I have two passions related to my career. Trading, which satisfies my competitive nature, but that's not, a, that's not enough for me. Um, the teaching provides a more overall uh, contentment for me. I just feel much more connected uh, when involved in the educational programs. And I think, I think a lot of it has to do with the interaction and the, that I get with a lot of you. Some of it's direct, and some of it comes through emails and, and through Julia. But uh, it's, it's kind of sad. It's kind of my social life. Um, but I do, I do enjoy it, and I do enjoy teaching. And in, in, that, in that vein, um, I, I thought a lot about how, how to present the information so you have a better chance of taking it forward. Uh, being connected requires of me the ability to communicate our ideas in a meaningful manner and reflect on in response to comments and questions from our clients. As I just was saying, our greatest challenge is to communicate highly complex material that is accompanied by a long learning curve. And what we're trying to do is shorten that learning curve. Trying to give you, we're trying to come up with a way to make the, the information more understandable, quicker, shorten that learning time so that you have a fighting chance and don't give up before you actually have a chance to put it to work. Um, as we said in the last paragraph is, we really do believe our goal is to help traders be the best that they can, they can be. When, when, while in Hawaii, and if Julia finds, that, uh, finds my office in Hawaii, we'll put it up so you'll see where this came from. Um, I completed reading, uh, Simple Rules, How to Thrive in a Complex World. Um, and it's a, it's a book I would, I would recommend that you read. It's not all, it's not 100% pertinent to things that we, that we do, but there is an awful lot that, that is. And I've had a lot of these ideas in my mind for some period of time. You've, we're going to talk about chunky in a while, and you've heard me talk about that psychological term before. Um, I've had it in my mind, but it's getting down and actually being able to put it all down in an organized form. Uh, I was helped considerably by, uh, by this book, who did address uh, most of the issues that I have, you know, I have thought about over, over time. Um, our goal during this webinar is to demonstrate how you can address complexity with simple rules. 
part of the problem that the reason that we do immersion type of education is we really don't think you have much of a fighting chance trying to learn trading one piece at a time because the the environment is never the same no two days are are the same and everything and the interrelationship of all these vehicles change all the time and that that makes it very very complex and it lengthens the uh, the learning the learning stage so we're trying to demonstrate how you can address complexity with simple rules and one of the things that the, the book ended with in the last page, last paragraph, um, for those who wield the power of simple rules, complexity is not destiny. I just thought that was just an, uh, an excellent way to end the book. And it was a, it's a great thought to put forward because really to understand that we do have a lot of empathy and sympathy with the complexity that you are all dealing with every single day every single day. There's substantial evidence showing that often simple rules outperform more analytically complicated and information uh, sensitive approaches. And the author stated that this is especially true when you see the links between cause and effect are poorly understood. Important variables are highly correlated. And what really caught my eye was the, was the third one when a gap exists be between knowing what to do and actually doing it. Um, I don't know how many times we have that discussion with people. I don't know how many times we get emails uh, with people very frustrated, um, you know, with that. Well, I knew what the market was doing. I couldn't pull the trigger or I got the trade on. I couldn't stay. I couldn't stay with it. And there, that is a huge, that is a huge gap. And of course, until you get to the point where you can actually, you know, put the trade on and follow it through to completion, whether it's a, a winner or a loss or a winner or a loser, it's very hard to start to get a, a routine and to build the confidence that allows you to continue to move uh, to move forward. One of the things that is can be misleading. A, a rule may be simple, such as respect price, but remember, it's only an price is only an advertising mechanism for, for opportunities. However, it may be a surrogate for a much deeper understanding of the market's continuous two-way auction process. So, on the surface, the rule is pre-direct respect price, but when you look underneath what that statement is, uh, it's actually it's actually a fairly uh, uh, fairly important and deep under, uh, understanding of what really is behind that idea of respecting price. This slide is a little bit of rambling on this slide, but another simple rule may be uh, focus on ruling reason, which is a term I often employ. The ruling reason for a day may be that the short-term inventory is dangerously long or short. Early in the morning, it may be that overnight inventory is long or short. Uh, today, the market didn't pay any early attention to overnight inventory. Yesterday, everything was about overnight inventory. Uh, going through today, uh, the ruling reason may have been that we had so many of those poor highs, poor highs up there. Now they've been cleaned. They've been cleaned up. So it's it's really um, sometimes you may have an awful lot of pieces of information you're looking at, but the really important, there may be one piece that is really important for that particular time. The following day may not, might, may not be relevant. There is often an assumption that the best way to arrive at a decision is by considering all the factors and weighing all the relevant information. The weakness with this approach is that traders tend to overweight peripheral variables which often leads to cognitive dissonance. Now, let me expand on that. That is, that statement, that last statement is extremely important. I talk to people and I get emails all the time of, of traders that have done a considerable amount of preparation for the following day. And in that preparation, 
they've got every reference above and below listed, and they've got prominent points of control going back, you know, for weeks that haven't been revisited. And they've really done an excellent job of identifying all those references, monthly, weekly, daily, et cetera. Um, the weakness, and this, is, and this is really important, the weakness with this approach is that traders tend to overweight the peripheral variables that leads to cognitive dissonance. So I'm staying in a second time, but it's something I really want you to focus on. When you do your preparation and when you get ready to trade, you have to bring it down, you have to bring it down to those things that are really important today. Um, and it's sometimes it's related, the ruling reason can also be related to another rule, and that is that the market has to take care of current business first. Today, I suspect that the early part of the day was spent taking care of early business first, and that early business was a series of poor, poor highs. We had a poor high yesterday, we had a poor high a couple of days ago, and those things, they just sit out there and there's stops above them, and they're, they're hindrances to the market really going down much, much more. So today it may have been, at least the first part of the day, may have been that it had to take care of current business. And the current business would be associated that the market got had gotten too short. And when you have those poor highs up there, a lot of times they're created because people are just emotionally selling. And when they do that emotional selling, um, you know, and they get away with it for two or four days, that gets the inventory pretty short. So the current business may be to get force those shorts to cover and then also clean up those highs. Another thing that, that, I, that I got from the book that I thought was really important, simple rules make it more likely that people will act on their decisions because they are easy to remember and less cumbersome to follow than complex guidelines. A lot of times, when I when I do the three, at least three scenarios a day, I try and keep them simple, understandable, executable. You could make it. You could make them very complicated. Well, this, if this, and this, and and have all kind of if ands and buts about it. But then you've got so many things that you're really not going to execute on that on those. So it's simple rules make it more likely that people will act on their decisions because they're easy to remember and they're less cumbersome to follow. As we continue through the master series, mastery series, we'll be stressing the importance of developing your own rules and suggesting how you might want to get started. We That's going to be and these rules, there, there's it's no one size fit all rules, fit all people. It's it's a very personal thing, um, and you'll see a quote here in a minute from from Steve Jobs that I that I think was just just a wonderful wonderful quote. But keep in mind this idea of of simplicity in developing your own rules. When you develop your own rules, you want them to be specific to you, and you want them to be short. The other point made in the book was simple rules also keep people from abandoning a decision once they have made it. Um, and that's the thing, how many times, you know, I, oh, I was going to do this, but when it got there, I didn't do this, you know, et cetera, um, which is no good, right? If you did, if you had the rule or you had, the, the, uh, had it spelled out, but you didn't execute, that's not of much value. One rule that we suggested is to place the trade and then monitor for continuation. All too often, traders fail to execute an, an original trade be, because they are unsure of the outcome. The best trades always have a risk component associated with them. If they didn't, if they didn't, it wouldn't be a good a good trade. So one of the things that we're going to be talking about as we go through the series is how how to make and how to write down so you understand the rules for continuation. It is far more important to put the trade on and monitor the trade than it is not to put the trade on. 
too many people can find so many reasons not to enter into a trade. And then afterwards they say, oh, I had it right, but I, you know, and you can't do that. It's so easy. It's so easy to find reasons not to do a trade. I got a, an email from somebody yesterday who's very discouraged. Yesterday morning, we had a poor high. We had a poor high on the market. They had read the market perfectly, but they couldn't get themselves to short because of the poor of the poor high. And of course, then it worked out very well. And that's only one one data point. But you know, if you can, if if you can learn, put the trade on and say, how do I monitor for continuation? Which will include what you want the market to do as well as what you don't want the market to do. It will include some element of of time, giving it time to work. Or, you know, if it doesn't work pretty quickly, you want out of the trade. Right now, we're, this is, you know, this is all things we're talking about here are all, you know, a little bit ambiguous and hard to actually get your hands on. But this is just to set you up so you have some idea what we're going to be trying to guide you towards as we go through the series. Um, remember, the last word I put on here, there was one inflexible rules. All rules must be written down. Everything else has got a lot of flexibility to it. But the rule that you must write it down, if you don't write it down, it's not a rule. So many times I've had things, oh, I don't need to write that down. Uh, I'll know that. I, I know that. And all of a sudden, guess what? I didn't execute. Uh, very important to, when you have the rules, that you write them down. Keep Jobs' comment. This was after he went back to Apple and led him out of a near bankruptcy. You have to work hard to get your thinking clear, to make it simple. But it is worth it in the end because once you get there, you can move mountains. The payoffs of simplification often dwarfs the cost of getting there. One of the things you'll find sometimes, you, spend, you can spend a tremendous amount of time getting down to the point that you have these simple rules. And when he when he's recognizing that, when he talked, you know, dwarf the cost of getting there, the cost of getting there a lot of times are an awful lot of time and pain to weed out. It's awful easy to make a list. So you make a list, oh yeah, I'm gonna do this, this, and this. But you have to weed that list down to just a very few simple executable ideas and rules. While trading requires mental flexibility, Daily preparation does not. You've all seen my routine for daily preparation. I can't stress enough that the importance of you doing your own preparation. Now, we get underway full scale this Sunday. Uh, this Sunday, when you get your report for Monday, and then starting, uh, starting next week, we will you'll be getting the full reports. You'll be getting two reports a day. Uh, we will have the, I wasn't mentioned, but we will have the chat function open, uh, the one-way chat. Uh, I may not chat as much during the first week as I will once we get to May 1st, because I got a few things to take care of. But the chat function will be open, and I will be making important chat comments, uh, starting with Monday's, Monday's market. So for all practical purposes, um, this, this is a, a real, the real educational program gets underway uh, in all seriousness on, the, on Monday morning. Um, but so many times, because I'm doing these reports, people say, well, I don't have to do this. You know, I'm going to get it. Oh, I'll do it after the, uh, the Mastery Series is over. I cannot stress enough the importance of you doing your own preparation report before you see mine. After you do your own, then you should compare it to what I've written and what's going to happen. When you first start, you know, you, you first start, you say, well, you'll just accept what I wrote. As you get through the course and as you get better and better, and you really start to gain an understanding, there'll be times you look at it and say, 
you know, I think he's wrong. I think he's wrong for the following reason. Well, I think he missed this. And guess what? That happens. I don't always get it right. But you won't, when you're first starting, you don't have enough background. But as we go through the program, it is amazing how many times I will get very insightful emails from clients saying, you know, why didn't you do this? Or did you miss this? And all of a sudden, sometimes it get very embarrassing. I said, you know, maybe I ought to sign up for the course myself. But it's so important that you build that habit from day one. Do the re preparation you, yourself. Be specific. Put down the trading scenarios. Then compare it. Then compare it to mine. The sequence and how that happens is extremely important. Because by the time we get, you know, a few weeks into the course, you'll have a pretty, a pretty good routine now. I think I said the other day, I was a little bit embarrassed, that um, since we got back into preparing for the Mastery Series, uh, my trading has improved considerably. Um, because I got lazy after the other, and then I did some traveling, and I'd come back and trade, and, you know, oh, I know that. Found the same trap that I tell you not to fall into. And all of a sudden, I mean, it's, it's, it's really embarrassing to me to realize um, how lazy I was and how much, uh, how well trading has been since I got back in the routine and doing what I'm supposed to be doing. One of the things, and then this comes from a discussion um, with Brett Steenbarger, who is, you know, we'll talk about again. Um, most of you know who he is. He's written many books on trading psychology, and he advises, you know, hedge funds and professional trading organizations. But we've done a lot of discussion, and, and one of the things that, you know, Brett said, he said, you know, it's amazing how many problems the traders have will go away or be minim minimized through the application of this rule, the rule, and the rule is just getting prepared, being prepared for the day. Again, um, this this is this is a key slide. Obviously, we said earlier the goal is for each of you to develop your own simple rules for analyzing, identifying, executing, and monitoring each trade. However, these simple rules will change. The rules you develop at the beginning of your trading career will be quite different as you gain experience. You know the rules that you would make. Two months from now, if you looked at them today, they'd be very complex and they certainly wouldn't be simple rules. But two months from now, you look back at the rules you had when you started and say, boy, those are really simple. Well, it's a progression. As you get experience, as you get experience, your rules will, rules will still be simple, but they'll be simple relative to that period in time. Um, and, and that's what is so important. Yes, there's simple rules, but these simple rules continue to evolve. If you're really going to learn to trade, they will evolve as you get more and more experience. What I see in the market today um, on first blush is probably substantially different than what most of you see, and that will make your rules different. But as you get more experience, you'll see more and more, and that will allow you to have new simple rules. Let me get some examples of rules that you might think about addressing. One of them will be, I, will I be a fast trader or a slow trader? Let me put this in some, some perspective. I'm going to escape here for a second. And I want to go to that today I want to go to. Okay. This is the seventeenth. Just to make it clear, when I, when I talk about this idea of do you want to be a fast, a fast trader or a slow trader, I'm going to show you two examples that be, can become 
very relevant. A fast trader may have been buying the, the E period low, the F period low, the H period low, the I period low, the J period low, the K period low, the L period low. You know, they're buying the, the fast trader. When I'm talking about being a fast trader, I'm generally talking about uh, people that are doing a, a lot of trades. They're doing fairly mechanical trades. And that's fine as long as you understand the risk involved. The risk involved, if you're going to be a fast trader, is you have to be right very quickly. Because if you don't, when you see there's three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, you could get one liquidating break that took out all of these three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine lows in one time, very, very quickly. The firecracker effect, taking out this low, sets off this low, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's okay to be a fast trader if, in fact, you have the discipline to get out if it doesn't work and know exactly what you're dealing with. What doesn't work is the fast trader that they're going to be indecisive. And if it starts to break down below this, they oh, well, I'll watch it. So when I'm talking about that decision, if you're going to make a decision to be a fast trader, it's not what I do, but there's nothing wrong with it. We have a lot of traders to do. There's a lot of professional traders to do that, but they do not get married to a position. So again, when you're making that decision, and I'm not promoting one or the other, but when you're making that decision, understand what you're dealing with. Now, as a contrast, I'm a slow, I'm a slow trader. So I'm going to show you in a few minutes why I went short. I went short on this market um, when I got back from Hawaii. And, you know, the market, as you can see, it went down quite a bit yesterday. So it was a very nice trade. There can be good trades for both slow traders and fast traders. The thing that is the thing that you really want to try and avoid is being a fast trader one time and a slow trader another time. It may, it may seem to make intuitive sense to you, but I don't think those are consistent. Trying to mix those, I, I don't think, are consistent with most of our personalities. I think you need to kind of settle on who you're going to be, how you're going to approach the market, and then write your rules. Write your rules for that. We can come back from that in, in, a, in a while, but I wanted to show that as an example um, in here. Fast, fast trader had a, had a great day. This market never stopped one time framing all day. I put the trade on after the day was over. I was a slow trader, and it worked out just fine. So those kind of things, those kind of things are important decisions to make. Know who you are. Your traders are not a jack of all of all trades. Okay, let's go back to. Oh, I didn't. I'm sorry. I didn't mean from the beginning. No. Will I take trades home overnight? If so, under what conditions? No. Some people may say I, that's not relevant because I'm I uh, I'm not taking trades home overnight, and that's fine. But if you are, you ought to have some rules. You know, for example, if the rule is. If you're taking it home because you have a loss on the trade, um, that's very that's probably very destructive, both psychologically and personally. If you have a valid reason for taking that trade home, um, then you ought to be able to spell that out, and you ought to have rules that cover that. Under what conditions, if any, will I engage in trading during the evening sessions? Okay. I trade quite frequently during the evening sessions. I might trade, for example, if a market was a trend day today and I have an afternoon pullback low, um, you know, I may buy if it goes to that pullback low overnight. Uh, the other day I came back and I'm going to show you in a minute, I did a trade 
over that I put on overnight. And it's okay, but know if you're going to do it, know what the conditions are and under what under what conditions that you will make that trade. Remember, it's not because of a whim and it's not because that you have a lot. Here's a tougher one. Developing rules to force you to constantly begin to think in terms of odds. And we will work on that considerably. One of the things, one of the things that does most traders in is they cannot get away from being addicted or overly influenced by price. Sometimes price is all there is. It's momentum day, the market's going up, and everything is about price. And that's good as long as you understand that. But on other days, it's not about price. It's about the structure. For example, I talked about it, you know, somebody yesterday emailed me. They had two good trades on, and they got out of both trades, uh, and, I, and I suspect because of price. They had good trades, and they were well-thought-out trades. They got out of both trades, and I suspect it was just because of, of price. And, and, you know, you get the trade on, and you start watching the thing go back and forth. It just plays on, you know. I think this one trade, I want to say the individual was in the trade 45 minutes to an hour before it before it worked. And it will just it'll just play the dickens with you. But if you understand why you got in the trade, and I, I think I'm going to break away from this for a second in a little while, and I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you that trade. I'm going to show you that thinking. I want to show you some idea of how to start to developing um, rules to start constantly think in terms of odds. We already talked about developing rules to monitor for continuation. We'll develop rules for trade entry and rules for trading around the opening. You know, um, a lot of times I don't have any interest in trading around the opening. There are conditions in which I will trade. You know, if I'm in balance, the center of yesterday's range, I have very limited interest. If I'm near the upper edge or the lower edge of the previous day's range or out of balance, which means bigger opportunities, then I may have a stronger interest in, de in developing or trading around the opening. But I ought to have some rule, some criteria that is well articulated that defines that. Because you will, I think, if you do that, you will take a tremendous amount of stress out of out of your trading. We're getting into, we're, we're just lining up now to get into a whole different section of what we're talking about here. The, this idea of being able to see the market visually is very important. I was growing disappointed with the book as I was within 20% of the end and the authors had not discussed choking. Julia, have you found my office yet? Yes, I put it in the handout section. Oh, why don't you throw it up here? We'll let everybody see uh, where I was because it was right when I was reading this section. You want to throw it up there for the fun of it? Yeah, I um, let me just grab it. Um, so many... And I, I want to show I want to show this, um, not so much to brag about uh, my office and my oh, surroundings, sure, sure. Um, sure. but rather I, I want to I want to I want you to understand the state of mind uh, where I was when I was reading this book, and what the top says I was growing disappointed with the book, is I was in twenty percent of the end and the authors had not discussed chunking. Are you ready to show it? I am. Okay. This Let me know. I'm, I'm waiting for GoToWebinar to cooperate with me. Oh, okay. All right. That's, <laughs> that was my office. I you see, oh, you and, see it. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah, I, I do see it. Yeah. That was my office, and uh, uh, that tree blocked the sun, and it was gorgeous. But... I, I spent a lot of time there, 
Uh, one of the things I like to do when I go away, I like to really reflect upon things that are meaningful to me and things that are going to be that I'm going to be working on. And getting ready to start the mastery series uh, was front and center in my in my mind. And I'm reading this book, and it's it's at this point in time I was disappointed because it hadn't brought together this one thing. I said, if it's a professional book, I can't believe that they're not going to talk about uh, this important subject. But I'm going to demonstrate it here in a minute. Anyhow, Julia, thank you. Uh, let me go back to my to my slides here. There you um, go. Okay, you can see me again. I'm, we're okay. Yes. Okay. I believe chunking is the fastest and simplest way to understand complex information and the important relationships between these important variables or factors. It's, it's visual. Chunking is the grouping of meaningful information into useful units, allowing for a clearer appreciation of the important interrelationships. Viewing each factor singularly greatly contracts the time it takes to make the connection between the parts, allowing you to make an informed trading decision. And I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a real life example here in just a minute. But the next thing was I talked about my friend uh, Brett Steenbarger. And sometimes I feel insecure because I'm not a psychologist. I do a lot of reading, but I put together a, a presentation. Um, an email, sent it to Brett, and I asked him, is this a fair representation? And I'm going to do two things with what we do now. First, I'm going to walk you through the email I sent to him, then we'll show you the response. But as I go through this example, I also want you to have some feeling of what I mean by chunking and what I get at it and what I see when I look at a when I look at a market. Um, this I just discussed about so we can move on as a, I know, maybe I didn't say but when we, we got acquainted when I wrote the first book and I got a 40 page plus response back from it in two parts and very detailed and uh, you know it, it helped me uh, open my eyes to a lot of things in the psychological area that um, that helped me advance and helped me uh, have information to pass on. But this is the first part of the email I sent to Brett. What you are looking at here is this is the first thing I looked at when I got back from Hawaii. I got back in Prescott, Arizona about 4 o'clock on Monday afternoon. I looked at the market and I'm going to walk you through what I saw. First of all, I saw that the market one time frame higher every single period. Now, remember earlier talking about fast traders? It was a grand day for fast traders. Never any pressure, never any meaningful give back. Never stop one time framing once. Then I look and I see the point of control. The point of control not, did not migrate higher. So when I'm looking at this, I'm saying, okay, um, and one of the things that is important as you think about developing rules and you think about trading, there are two sets of emotions that are very important for you to reflect on. The first are the your emotions, personal emotions as a trader. And the second are the emotions of those people you are competing against. When I look at this, I see that the market has gone straight up one time frame higher all day long. Never any relief that allowed inventory to readjust. So at this point in time, what goes through my mind is there is an awful lot of traders out there, weak traders, probably momentum traders, 
Momentum traders are basically traders following price, and following price, they bought the market all day long. Never did they get shaken out of their trades. They probably, those that took trades home long, probably felt very confident. The market looked in the low, or started on the low of the day, closed on the high of the day. What a wonderful day. I got a great position here. I look at that and I see, I see a lot of inventory in the week in week hands. Then I look at the prominent point of control, reading from left to left to right. And I see it didn't migrate higher. So then I say, well, there's probably a lot of people that were by this late buying, probably a lot of traders getting long at poor prices, just the opposite, just the opposite of getting short at poor prices. Then I also, in fact, I actually saw this first, I saw the P formation. This is the stem of the P, and then this is the loop. And I said, okay, what happened today? Uh, looks like the market started out early in a short covering mode. That short covering mode got prices moving to the upside. That encouraged the momentum trader, traders that are only looking at price. And before the day was all over, uh, we had an awful lot of long traders and probably weaker traders holding long positions. And I have a pretty good idea that these are the traders that can turn that position and, and panic out of those trades pretty, pretty quick. So that's what I, that's chunky. When you look at what I just went through, you're looking at the market vigilantly. That is a great example of chunky. And I'll come back to that in a second. So this, this was in the email. And you can say, uh, good morning, Brett, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, and you can see what I, I wanted um, to do an educational program. And I went through what I saw when I looked at that. And it took me, we're talking about, it took me 10 times as long to explain it to you as it did for me to look at it. What happens as you get proficient at this, this stuff jumps out at you. When I look, what I just covered, that probably came to me in less than 10 seconds when I pulled up the market, when I looked at the profile and looked at it. But I'm spelling out to the same things we just talked about. I'm spelling it out so Brett knows what I see. He knows exactly what I'm what I'm talking about. Um, there's the final upward expiration during the final 30 minute period represents an opportunity to fade or go against the latest price move. You see early on, it's a one time framing continued throughout the session. One time framing only ends blah, blah, blah. This by itself doesn't necessarily represent an opportunity to fade or go against the market. When the POC did not move higher, that alerts me more and more, but price moves higher. So the final upward expiration during the final 30 minutes looked to me like a probably a good opportunity to fade or go against the market. However, it didn't stop there. The last thing I did, which, you know, I had to open our site and I had to take a look at the check of New York Stock Exchange volume, which was low. I think it was uh, under, uh, it was considerably low. I think it was under 2728, but it was very low. So now I did that as a final check. Um, had it been higher, it would have served as an alert that there may have been something more seriously occurring during the session. I didn't see it. So at this point in time, and I'll come back and show you what I did in a minute, and you see the reasons why. Final paragraph, to Brad, I'm trying to help students appreciate what is possible with training experience. I want them to appreciate the importance of visualization versus algorithms or a mathematical approach. At first, they may only spot the very visible POC. Learning to think in terms of the POC, or fares price which business is being conducted, can then start them on the way to recognize, recognizing a non-elongated or truncated profile, which in turn leads to asking, why is the profile not elongated, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we can take that further, and sometimes we say, why is it too elongated? Why does it have the P formation? Why does it have the B formation? But so this is, I was just trying, I was trying to tell Brett how I want to approach this 
with all of you, and I want to use this idea of chunking. And remember, in the slides we said one of the one of the things that does it allows you to realistically look at some very complex information and relationships in a very fast visual manner. The answer I got back from Brett. This is a great illustration. I like how you pull things together. And chunking does seem like a good word for it, as you are grouping information into meaningful units. Very helpful for students to be able to get inside your head and see what you're seeing. So I got the I got the, the confirmation from a very knowledgeable professional professional. I didn't want to be in the position of presenting information to you that somebody in that had more experience and Jim, I see some holes in what you're doing. So I just I I, I want you to understand the process we went through um, to go this, the thinking, the reading, and this wasn't undertaken lightly. And a lot of it was undertaken, this whole idea of the rules and the simplification with frustrations that we have so many times with traders not being able to put the pieces together and the timeline being too long to get to the point where it's usable information. Constantly, as I said early on, trading I do for my competitive instincts. The education is where I get contentment. And this, to get the satisfaction, I need to know that we have done the best possible job and we have tried to be creative in thinking how to present the information to you. The weekend highlight reels, which have been so well received, provide another example of chunking. When you look at those, you're seeing the market in action and you're seeing those relationships those complex relationships, how they fit into one P, one, one um, reel. When you first learned to back a car out of a garage, you were engaged in chunking. It got smoother and faster each time you backed out. You were learning and improving with each attempt. Um, I did have a second thought on this because I spent a lot of time as a very young kid in a cast, in fact, all summer because the next door neighbor backed out of his garage and, and ran over me, which left me in quite a condition uh, for the summer. But uh, I also discovered during that time that I was attempting to dig a hole to the other side of China, which as I told you could do. Um, I never got there. Worked all summer on it, but it never made much headway. We're, we're applying the same concept to the upcoming mastery series. Your simple rules for making and executing trading decisions will advance like you were backing out of the garage. I want it to be, we want it to be, I'm sorry for using I so much. We want it to be this experience that moves you forward and almost so smoothly you don't recognize it. You know, when you back out of the garage, it gets better every time. As you go through these, these courses and you work on these rules, this is what we want it to be. What we're gonna spend an awful lot of time looking at examples uh, and chunking information as one of the simple ways to present this information. Now, let me go back and I talked about this observation right here. Okay, and when this was chunking, took me just a few seconds. You saw I checked the volume and then I put the trade on. Um, Maybe because I'm an addict, but I put the trade on as soon as I came home. Um, let's throw in the uh, the overnight. And I put the trade on. This was the prominent point of control. I estimated where the puts would be. I put an order in to get out just a little bit above the point of control. I went to sleep. I got up. The order was executed. And it was a nice start to, to the day. That is That was the result of chunking. There was an economic benefit. I was able to do this quickly. Uh, it was an economic benefit. I was able to do it with an option. I was able to sleep. Anyhow, um, I just I, I wanted to make it as real as possible. Let me go back before we open for questions. And 
we had that same same thing this morning. If you notice, the red line is yesterday's high. Early this morning, the market opened. It went within one tick of filling the gap. The market rallied. Market came back down in a finally in a period, and it filled the gap and went into yesterday's range one tick below yesterday's high. The market rallied again. Okay, when I'm looking at this, I'm saying this the whole time. I'm questioning that this is a legitimate low. That it does it. I mean, that is chunking. I'm looking at that. I'm looking at the relationships. I'm looking over here, but I'm also looking out. I had a poor, I had a poor high over here. I had a poor high yesterday, and so I said, well, there's probably a lot of stops up here. And incidentally, the market has to trade there in the day time frame session to consider that repair, which it which it did. And then the market, you know. Um, you got some sell-off, then it rallied again, and then you got another sell-off. This is probably related to crude oil, which was dropping pretty hard. But oh, then you say overall, value is pretty high, uh, is higher today. I still have a very prominent point of control down here. So you've got a nothing market. Early volume was was 72, uh, I think uh, 272 to begin with, exceptionally low. So I also factored that in. So again, that is another example of, of chunky. We're going to use we're going to use yesterday's market, which on the surface, you would say that yesterday, you know, it was an inside day and very little to do. It actually, it actually was a wonderful day to trade. Um, and we're going to use yesterday for this weekend highlight reel to take you through trading an inside day and some of the chunking information um, that I was using yesterday. Um, one was, I'm going to split this out for just a second. Early morning, the A period you had all of these single prints in A period yesterday morning. And I looked at that and I said, there's too many single prints for being an inside day. Now, a lot of you that have been with us before caught that pretty quickly. And, and this is where, you know, you're thinking advanced. You just say, okay, if you were breaking out of a multi-day balance and you had all those single prints, hey, that may be a sign that this market really got something going. But these single prints all take place within, they all take place uh, within an inside day. Now, wait a minute. That is your game experience. Another form joint. You say that is not, that looks like it's over-enthusiastic uh, buying by, you know, um, short-term traders, which it was. And that allowed me to, to look at an early morning short against, against a poor eye. And I talked about uh, this one trader that's gaining a lot of experience, frustrated. He, he had that trade. He had that short. But then the poor eye kept him out. Well, those we talk about making decisions okay one piece of data it's probably not the ruling reason but those are the kind of things that we learn to to work with and we say okay we're always making decisions always making trade-offs but using structure in order to help make that decision one of the things we want to do throughout the master course is better equip you or you help yourself better equip yourself to be able to think in terms of odds rather than price all right and like i said this will be this will be the subject of the high right highlight reel over the weekend i'm sorry let me let me show one more example you'll see it again but this is 
talking about how how do you think about markets. I'm going to mark the A period low. So the market broke hard in E period. Got some follow through in an F period comes back up to within two ticks of the A period low. I recorded that immediately, mentally, made a note also on a side of paper, that that's probably pretty mechanical, pretty mechanical sellers. Now, G period comes on, comes down, and finally it goes back in back above the A period, it fills that, this would have been a double distribution, it goes back and fills it by a single tick. Then it sells off again. At that point in time, I said, okay, sold off in F period, sold off in G period, guess what? This is mechanical traders following price getting very short. In H period came down, and when H period broke, I used that opportunity to go long. Now, the individual I was talking about got long in G period. So he had to watch the price gyration here and here, and I suspect that it just kind of weighs on you for a while. Had you, if you really could get inside and, and think about the emotions and think about who's selling from just two ticks below, who's selling one tick back into the distribution, that kind of thinking helps you understand who you are competing against. These are weaker, weaker hands traders when they sell at exact references. So I was more comfortable in, in fading that move. And it also had an excess bow. Again, I, I'm just showing that as an example of how you should start to think about markets. Now that, uh, keep in mind, that's my way of trading. That's slow trading. A fast trader may have well sold when the F period came back up to just short of this. That would be a legitimate fast trader sell. And, and it worked. But again, the, if, the fa if the trader's going to trade like that, and you have to have rules for it. And one of the rules is if you're wrong, you don't hang around. Because when they start to get the short covering, it can take them a long way. But so there's there's room no matter how you trade, whether you're going to be a fast trader or a slow trader, you have to have rules. You have to think about what it is. What is going to what are you looking for to do these trades? How are you going to monitor this trade for continuation? When I am long here, there's two ways, there's two things that I'm looking at to monitor for continuation. One is positive. I need to see H period take out the G period high. G period took out the F period high. So one time framing was stopped. Then I need that one time framing to continue. I need H period to also take out G period. If that doesn't happen, I'm probably going to execute that trade. That's what I need to happen on the upside. On the downside, I don't need it to go back down and start finding acceptance in this little tail down here. So again, there's rules that we can develop. Anyhow, we've talked a lot today. We've talked a lot today about the types of things that um, we're going to be working on, this idea of chunking, this idea of simplified rules, understanding that these rules will migrate into different rules as you get more experience. Your rules will be different than my rules. We threw in the idea that, you know, you start with one, look at the point of control. And once you've got that, you're thinking and you're watching. That may lead to you to start thinking about elongation, non-elongation. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things to think about. Remember, this is part of the Kickstart program. This is part of just getting you warmed up prior to the program really getting underway. Julia, I've talked without any questions far too long. Let me take a few questions, please. Thank you. That's great. No, it's fine. It's good to get it all out there. And uh, we have several comments, questions. So I'm going to start with 
is taking out the two poor highs this morning an example of the market taking care of current business first? Absolutely. I, that's, that's my opinion. Could that's you collapse opinion. that and get back to the market so they can see that, you know, collapse the, uh, yeah, just so they can see the two poor highs you're referring to. Overnight does not I'm, count. I'm going to take all the overnight out of here, make it much simpler. So you had, you had a poor high um, for two days in a row. But technically, poor that poor high was repaired. The thirteenth, the thirteenth poor was repaired, high was yes. repaired with another yeah. poor high. So it, this was another poor high, and then you had a poor high here. And this stuff, oh, when I you see this, what it tells you is there was no aggressive selling. So who sold at those exacting levels? You know the the day the day's high, etc. More than likely, that is your weakest hands sellers. The selling wasn't if good solid stick with it money selling. It's going to sell and you know be done with it. They're not going to look for those exact references. Their size is too big to allow them to do that. So when you look at that, that's information, and this tells you there's probably a lot of short term money is on the short side. So, and a lot of times it's not relevant right away, but once it gets up there and it got up there overnight, then they're squeezed. Then they're squeezed. And so this market opens this morning and there was this panic buying. Like I say initially one tick above yesterday's high, then one tick below yesterday's high. This panic, but these are these shorts panicking to buy. And it's also momentum traders buying price because price is higher. But yeah, yes, in my opinion, that was an example of a market taking care of current business. Jim, do you want to hover over your time template so we can turn off that composite profile to the far right on your chart as it's a duplicate? Just hover over them. Don't click anything. No, you got to open them. And just open the want? template. If you open the templates back up and you hover over oh, them, you want my you'll, because it's just for people who are new, it's just an, no, just, just, open the time templates and hover until that one highlights. No, don't drop down. See it right there? Yeah, take this off is the today. One you want. Yeah, thank you. The entertainment is free. Okay, um, a second question. You, yeah, and we can close the time templates so they can see more. If value, well, let's start at the beginning. Um, she's kind of uh, bucking your trade when you got back from Hawaii with the overnight and the prominent point of control on April 17th. And she's saying, um, you know, it, you know, doesn't it help that value was virtually unchanged that your trade worked and that the market is in a trading range? This late day short, that you did would not have worked in the midst of a bump, and and uh, I he's and she said yes. Buying his puts at 4 p.m. on the 17th wouldn't have worked in the midst of a Trump bump. I think the fact of being in a trading range matters. I think, and I of said, course. well, right, yeah. But I had made the point that I said it may not work for a higher time frame trade, but for a day trade, there are still day trades that work counter to the Trump bump everything everything is a series of facts surrounded by other circumstances and the you know the momentum the momentum we had going following the election you know then reverted back to a trading environment and the trading environment you're absolutely right totally different totally different circumstances okay. and that's that's really uh was very much in my mind Jim, right here and now, we've had a nice tight inside bar and G period, and H broke out of it. And, you know, a signature trade would be two ticks below the G, one could short. And it did come, make a poor high here and then bounce a little bit if one missed the initial entry. Would you agree with that type of um, execution? Not necessarily. And the problem is... Um, you get bonds. Here's what's driving 
this break in crude oil is what's driving this market, which makes it very, very dangerous. Um, but let's go back to who you are again. I don't like, I don't like the short when when uh, H takes out G because this thing's been grinding lower. The point of control is up here. This is grinding, and, and to me, that's a dangerous short. Yeah, I'd like to see it get back down to yesterday's prominent point of control, which was like 10 periods wide, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 periods wide. But this is this is so grinding. The market could be getting too short. Again, that's a personal choice. Mm -hmm. If you if you do short when G period goes below this, your stop's got to be very tight and you got to be very disciplined. Now we have a poor low from today. So you got another factor to to pull into it. We have a poor low uh, because these two match. So again, but I don't I don't like that late entry. Yeah, it's, that's it's a personal not, choice. Right. The, the trade very location. Choice. If but you've it, got the discipline and you can turn a trade in a second if you're wrong, fine. All right, what else we got? And and it's a look above a three day balance as well. Not compelling excess, but technically excess with the two ticks and A period. And I guess, uh, you know, the trade when it was coming back inside the, you know, the uh, high of yesterday would have been more ideal. Um, and, but, but it's it been tough, grinding, it like you say. Because, yeah. yeah. Tough trade because there's no volume. There's no volume. There's no real, there's no real interest on either side of this market. Um, and like I say, unfortunately, well, no, this this is coming off of crude. Um, it's a the, this market is very very indecisive. In um, the okay, no, that's okay. Go ahead. In the report, Jim mentioned breaking out of balance could lead to excess, and to go with the breakout. It broke out and failed on the upside. How would the profile tell me that was going to happen? Okay, I walked through it before. One, the market opened, and the low in the first period, on the early early A period, was a single tick above yesterday's high. That is not a healthy. That is not a healthy low. The next low in A period was one single tick below yesterday's high. You want to point to that for them just to help them along. No, I, 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 because I, I, you know, there, there's. The, I put earlier before. I said there's the red line, and I discussed that earlier. That first was above it. Then the A period low was one tick back. That is not high confidence. That is not high confidence low. Those are mechanical lows. And the chances, the chances of having an upside breakout of uh, that continues out of that are very low given given the lack of confidence surrounding and the mechanical trading surrounding um, the trade relative to yesterday's high. Now there was one webinar early on when we were uh, uh, doing an educational program that we got a, a low like that one tick and it turned out to be a hell of a trend day to the upside and I missed all of it. But those are decisions you make when I'm talking about odds based trading. Odds based trading isn't if you miss a trade for the right reasons, that's fine. It's when you miss a trade for the wrong reasons. If I decide I don't like the low, I don't think it's secure. I don't want to go long. That's a personal choice. That's a personal choice. Um, and that's fine. What you need to do is have reasons for you doing mean, what you're doing. You don't want to go short. If you see a poor low, you said, I don't want to go long. That's a personal choice. Did you well, mean no, to say, I don't want to go long? This oh, was a I, breakout okay. to the upside. And the low, was, the low was poor and questionable. So, you know, uh, I'm not that excited about going long. You know, but I'm also Early watching and I'm saying it's taking care of a lot of this other business. Those things happen in the market. So many times traders get frustrated because they want things to be neater, cleaner, and more scientific. They're not. There's a lot of complexity that you have to bring into, into understanding what's going on. And this is the advantage of going through the mastery series from we have a long time to work on it. We have a long time to look at day after day and different circumstances. So you start to get a flavor. You may remember that the background for this started and it was really Julia's idea because when we would do um, 
you know, these three and four day programs in hotels, we get a lot of positive, you know, feedback from these. But I was not satisfied that people got enough information to really take it and use it on their own. And Julia came up with this idea, and that led to what was called the first intensive, where we extended the period, because every single day is different. But that extension allowed, allowed us to have a fair chance to give you the knowledge you need in order to take this information forward. Is it confusing? Absolutely. One of the things that we talk about these simple rules, and we talked about the rules we're talking about for all of you, they will change as your experience changes. A simple rule that doesn't change has a tendency to be widely followed and can lead to some real opportunities in there. And one of those rules is price-based momentum trading. Price-based momentum trading, um, because it is they're very simple rules in a lot of cases to follow, gets an awful lot of participation. And early on, as I've said so many times, early on uh, when a market is getting started, you know, price momentum can be very healthy. In this, you know, and in the last stages, in the last stages of it, of, of, a, of a momentum rally, in the last stages, you're starting to, you have price still going higher, but you're starting to see a drop off in volume and you're starting to get the laggards, you know, in the market, inventory getting far too high, uh, too long, markets going up because the rules are so easy to follow. Anybody, anybody can do momentum trading because the rules are relatively simple. But that's also, that brings a lot of people into it, and it is by far the most popular form of trading. But it also is one of those things that provides um, the most danger when it's finally over. Okay, I just we're looking at this. Uh, yeah, it, it broke out. The H was good. We've now made the point of control. Well, uh, we made unchanged. Yeah, we made the unchanged, and the, point unchanged. Of, and, and, the, and the point of control. Well, the but, point of control is lower. But we've yeah. had a question, and it was while it was still in F, I guess we had that poor low for a little bit. And, you know, does the point of control become a magnet because it's also, you know, very close to the settle or unchanged? Oh, sure. Yeah, that right. whole, that whole, Sorry you know, the, whole question. Fatness, the whole fatness of the profile can become a magnet. Right. Okay, a couple more questions. Well, we got a the question. Questions, hold on just a second. The questions people have asked have been specific questions about a trade. I haven't heard any questions. Well, give us a second. Give us a chance here. Um, we got a question. How do you ter determine the probabilities for a particular trade? Okay, this is, a, this is a great question. And through experience, one of the things that that I've talked about is I've had people with great scientific minds uh, say, well, I, I really am not very interested in what you have to say, Mr. Dalton, because you're, you're, you're not capable of giving me the exact um, odds. And if you give me, unless I have the exact odds, then I don't think it's valid. And my simple, re my response to that is always very simple. Um, when you're driving your own personal car and your car goes on to ice, uh, do you have to have the exact odds before you decide to be careful and slow down? Or you just intuitively know that you're going to have more risk driving your car on ice than driving it on dry pavement. I don't need the exact odds to know that. And we're not going to have exact odds. But it's just like looking at two back-to-back -back poor lows that weren't taken out. That greatly increases the odds that 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 the current rally to the downside is not going to have lasting legs because the odds are that the current that three-day high the odds were that the current three-day high was not completed was not a good high. As you can see it finally came back today and it took that out. 
And so, I mean, that's one of the things. Yesterday, when I was talking yesterday about uh, the trade, um, let me break this out again. Coming down in, in F period, just short of filling the double distribution. G period filling at one coming down. This is the odds calculation. The odds calculation is that there's the the odds are that the people selling this are fairly late laggard price based traders, and the odds are pretty good that that they're going to get themselves caught too short. Do I have the exact odds? No, but it's this it's that odds based thinking. And once you get into that habit, it so many times people want to they want to make it a crime, concrete. They want to actually look at the odds. Are they eighty percent? Are they ninety percent? You know, and it's not that. It's a form of form of thinking, just like driving on ice. Let's be cautious. Uh, but those that odds based thinking. One of the things that we're going to work on throughout the uh, the mastery series. Okay, a couple more questions. Yes. For the past few days, I've noticed that the developing value area expands, constricts, moves up and down as the day progresses. Is this something worth watching? Maybe you could make an overall um, comment oh, about absolutely. value area assessment. Yeah. If the, uh, you know, if, if I were to start on a single, a single rule, uh, a single rule would be that you must write, you must do your preparation in writing. The next rule would be learn to focus on developing value each day. Now, today you say, well, my golly, Jim, that wouldn't help me much today. I mean, value is higher and the market's going lower. But there were other factors. Overall, if you learn, if you learn to begin understanding developing value, it will greatly increase your odds of trading effectively. For example, somebody mentioned the other day, this day I did the, I did the short. The, odd, the, the value was inside. So the market was trying to go higher. There's the opening. The market was trying to go higher all day long. Price went higher all day long. And the best they could get was inside value. When I look at that, when I look at that, that tells me that the odds of upside continuation at that time are fairly low. Change the circumstances. Make this elongated. Give me overlapping to higher value. Now you have a whole different set of odds that you're looking at. But it's that, it's learning to do that kind of thinking, and we will focus on it continually as we go through the mastery series. It's so important. The first thing is important to be is to just to get in your mind. You're going to ask these questions about odds. You're going to start thinking yourself, what are the odds in here? They're not going to be exact, but no, it's a great it's a great question, and that's going to be so important. But the first thing I would start with every day is where is value developing today? Value is developing higher, right? Okay, the market's going lower, but I look over and I say, okay. What's going on today? Not not a lot. Crude's now down 119. Uh, I think a lot of that is knee-jerk reaction from short-term sellers based on crude oil. And we don't trade in a vacuum. You know, there's no formula for this. It, you, there's a certain time you have to be alert. You have to be alert to the to the market. And alert, I just, I know that the market, the 1030 oil report comes out. I, I know it happens this time every week. And you just get accustomed to looking. Sometimes it has no effect. Put it out of your mind and, you know, forget about it. Today, nothing else going on in this market. It had an impact. Two more questions. Okay. Well, we have a few more. But could you cancel that uh, collapse, that profile, please? Uh, quick question on the 17th. You talked about the triple distribution. Um, could you um, elaborate on it? Um, when we have, well, he, okay, I'll get to the other question you have, but uh, the triple distribution, could you comment on that? It. I don't see a triple distribution. Um, I think that was uh, the report, Jim, 
we did it was for the 13th, actually. Remember, we used three distributions in the recap and prep report for... Yeah, there was three on that. It was, I had one up here, I had one in here, and then I had the final one down here. Okay. Also, um... See how these just kind of fall out naturally? You know, it's very thin, fattens up very thin again. And the report said, the report said, you know, when we have a triple distribution like this, we treat each day as a separate day or auction. So what we're looking for, do we open in or out of balance relative to this lower distribution? Well, guess what? We opened out of balance to the upside. That is normally a very positive, at least short-term position. You're open out of balance relative to the lower distribution. That is normally a buying indication. Okay couple more okay. questions. Yes. When you um, comment on the, uh, when we have a balanced inside day, the inside day rules apply or the balance rules to the inside day high and low, or should it apply to the highest high of the two sessions and the lowest low? For example, yes, uh, Monday and Tuesday, the 17th and the 18th. It's if there's a great difference between the high of the last balance day and the high of the three-day balance, or two then day. you're going to look at the high of the current day. Today, when they're so close together, look at the high of the three-day balance. Just use this, you know, instead of, it, it, instead of trying to make it exact, just kind of look at it. Now, the low, the low, because the three-day low is considerably lower than yesterday's low. So I was focused on the yesterday's low. From a practical matter, these were all so tightly together, I'd be looking at the high of the three-day low. Right. You just compromise trade location. You have more confirmation, but it's really a personal decision. Um, um, on the 17th that you talked about earlier, and you may want to split this out, from E to J period, and it was a long time the market was in less than a four-point range, we could see a poor high forming. And yes, there were poor highs all day um, forming. Could we have sold this market? Because you were talking about the buyers, you know, on at the lows. He's asking, could we have sold this market? Um, and for him, he's saying, um, though it did not work. I wouldn't have. I would have, what I would have waited, what I would have waited to do, I would have waited for an opportunity if this stopped. Like if L period come below here, probably you're going to get a you know pretty good punch on the uh, um, downside. Pretty good punch of the uh, firecracker effect. Mm -hmm. But, you know, leaning in, Leaning into the wind on a day like this is very, very difficult. What happens so many times, a market gets a tone for the day. And if there's nothing going on, the weaker traders, they just carry that tone throughout the day because that's the easiest thing, that's the easiest thing for them to do. And that's just something that, you know, you gain with experience. Um, you know, now... And when I, when I did this, you could say, well, wait a minute, Jim, you did your puts up here. Well, because one of the reasons I'll do something like that, I go back and I say, okay, these people, I think there's a lot of weak longs in this market. After they go to, that they get done today, and they might have to say, wait a minute, what have I done? And they get a whole different feeling. And they start thinking more about their inventory. And then you can, and, you know, the point of control didn't rise. I said, well, I've got weak traders with weak inventory, pretty good chance that they're going to bail out after the day is over, after the, 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 the moment of this constant higher price throughout the day went away. A lot of times you've got to be very careful. You may have a tone for the day. It may be up. The market may look like a really poor structure and really a terrible day. But that tone exists, and particularly in a trading environment, Money in the trading environment because you don't have you don't have any real dominance on either side of the market. You have no real longer term money either side. Now let me stop for a second. I'm going to come back while it's here. We ask about 
taking the short on H period outside of G. My comment was, right off the top of my head, I wouldn't take the short because of the way the market was grinding lower. That's tempo. As you can see, it did go down substantially more, but it came it came back very quickly. And I just try to avoid these kind of situations. When it was, I respect tempo a lot. And the tempo, when the tempo was slow, value is higher, I'm very cautious. Mm -hmm. Okay, and another couple of questions. Yes. Um, we have acceptance in yesterday's range, but we're not getting anywhere. Shorts are getting trapped? Very possibly. Your value is higher. Remember, we remain in a trading environment. There's just... You know, there's just so little going on. There's so much uncertainty out there. There's just, it's just so much uncertainty. It's, un, it's unbelievable. And nobody knows what they want to do, whether it's long-term or short-term money. And that uncertainty can really put the market in a funk. But you got to stay alert is because one of these days, we're going to come in here and all of a sudden, you'll be into a whole nother, nother mode. Markets don't stay in balance very long. Um, and I, I just, I stalled there asking a question because I had a comment in my head. But as far as the 17th and that grinding higher and all, it is worth mentioning, like you said in the report for that day, that it was Orthodox Eastern Europe. So clearly, it you know, the volume wasn't you know, commensurate with a typical S&P day with yeah. Europe on remember. holiday. I don't remember making that comment. Um, well, you made it, a, I guess, on Wednesday, the prior week, talking about Friday, Good Friday coming up for U.S. markets and the holiday. And okay. I guess I'm, I'm extending that out to the Monday trade. I just wanted to mention it to traders because that's the kind of day where they can get away with stuff like that. Because there's not really yeah. anybody in the market pushing them around. They can push yeah. the market around with the lower volume. We see it all the time. I just wanted to throw that out there to yeah. people. Um, Jim says he never has had a rule he hasn't broken. Were those occasions due to overruling reason a majority of the time? If not, can he respond to his statement of previously breaking rules? You know, there's never a rule you haven't broken in regards to today's presentation. Just do what I say, not what I do. <laughs> you know, Aren't you fun? No, I mean, that's there's a lot of truth to that. Um, you know, we have an ego like everybody else. Sometimes, it, you know, I mean, I've had rules. I've gotten stubborn and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll add to something I shouldn't have added to uh, gets my rules, my thinking. But, you know, and that we, we do those things. We all have mental slips. Now, there may be, if, if I break a rule for a reason, okay, that may, you know, that's okay. As long as I know why I broke it. I know why I broke it, and it was a legitimate, and it was a legitimate reason. Um, then, then that's okay, as long as you understood and you made it consciously. When it's wrong is when it's emotional or when it's competitive, you're making for emotional or competitive reasons, that's when you have a tendency to, to really get hurt. Um, let me give you an uh, example of something I've changed over time. I had a rule for a long time that I would not add to a losing position. Okay? I learned that. That is no longer. Pardon? I learned that rule from you. Okay? That is no longer my rule. Uh oh. I varied that rule. And my, my rule now is that I will have a maximum position size for a trade. And let's say I'm going to be doing a five lot. If I put two on now, I'm free to put the other three on, either two at a time or one at a time, um, as I see fit. And that happens. And the reason I made that change, I have a tendency. I have a tendency 
to lean into the wind a little bit. When I see something developing, I'm not sure how long it's going to take to play out. So I may put on I may put on a two lot. And okay, then if it and if I'm, you know, it does work its way lower, but it's nothing dramatic, I may put on the rest of it. That is fine. That is fine. And I've altered my rule to allow for that. It's now related to uh, to size, position size for that trade, because this and it's actually worked out fairly good to me. But it was addressing something that I have a tendency sometimes to get into a little a little early, and I have quite a bit of patience, particularly because I do it with options. Uh, but again, if my position size is five or ten or whatever it is. Um, once I get there, do not add do not add to that position. Um, the the tendency so often when you break a rule so often it had to do with your with your ego or your competitiveness and when that's the case that usually spells an awful lot of trouble because and and what you're no longer in you're no longer in control you're no longer in control once you start thinking that way you know as i said a lot of times uh it's just so much i think i made the statement earlier Successful trading involves understanding the emotions, two sets of emotions, your own and those you trade against. I believe that they are both equally as important. I know, particularly when I'm trading against momentum traders, I know that they have a tendency to take things to extremes, just like they did on we were looking at the day the other day. One time framed it all all day long. Seventeen. And I know that. So you know that's an emotion. I can use that in one in one aspect. I don't go against it. Something early. If that's where it's going, and there's no other stronger money on the opposite side of the trade. But I can say that when that's all over, when they finally run their course, that may present a very interesting opportunity for them. But I have to understand my emotions. Understanding both sets of emotions is extremely important. Julia, I'm going to take one more question. And well, then I'm okay. Going to sign off. Okay. Well, I have a bunch more, but um, we're going to be All back right. at 4:30, and it 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 is. Let, uh, me, let me limit you to five. Will you pick out five? Um, I'm just getting very hoarse. So give yeah, me five. Yeah, and it, you know these are things that we're going to continue to go over um, during the program. And I know some of the questions are coming from people already enrolled, so um, fear not. Um, uh, we, side, side line here. As I told Julia last time, a lot of times when I keep trying to get off the phone, that means at my age I need the washroom. That's the bathroom. I've tortured <laughs> him some days, but really not knowing <laughs> secretly. Um, okay. So, Presently, we have a weak low because it went back to the settlement. It tagged it exactly. Laggards selling into into value, um, laggards selling, and value not moving lower. Is this an accurate assessment? Yeah, it's still a weak low. It's a nothing day. Remember when I commented, it's grinding all the way down. It's it the selling is not strong. The selling is not strong. If you had strong selling. There's no way you're going to stop exactly at the at unchanged or whatever it is, uh, and your value wouldn't be higher. You've got weak selling reacting to crude oil in here, you know. Okay. And, and you know, you just there's sometimes you've got to accept that it is a nothing market, and if you're going to trade those markets, you got to be pretty pretty nimble, and you got to expect that you're going to get some whipsaws in those markets. There is no shame in staying out of a market on a particular day. Jim, no shame whatsoever. Talking about the volume, because volume is so low, should we, you know, put much in, you know, weight into inventory conditions? I'm always, I'm always, I'm always focusing on inventory conditions. Whether volume is low or high, if volume is low and an inventory is long or short. It's it's probably longer, probably even more important because it's long by uh, long or short by held by weaker traders. 
Yeah, I'm glad you asked that. Thank you. Um, I want to bring up this question um, because it's about mind over markets and how you've changed. Today looks like, would you have considered yesterday a neutral day? Also, today looks like a neutral day. Do you want to just make a comment to him about that labeling? Yeah, I don't label that way anymore. Today, yesterday was a was a balanced day. A balanced day is basically a neutral day. I just don't. I don't. It's an inside on, balancing day. Yeah. When I first when I first got involved, I took the information I got from Stottlemyre. I used those same labels as I looked at things over the years. I found, for example, labeling the days. I found to be counterproductive because a lot of times, sometimes you you what you label once you put a label on it, oh I got it, and then you quit really understanding what is going on underneath the surface of that day. So I found labeling is very very counterproductive in my in my opinion. And um, the, the report really sizes up. You know, you wrote the book 27 years ago. I mean, it, you were looking at profile for a maximum of four years. So obviously, it's been almost three decades, not to point that out. But, you know, it's been a long time since you wrote so that book. This so, is kind of like if I wasn't your best friend, I wouldn't tell you. <laughs> well, I'm just, you know, getting it out there. I know you're sensitive, so I'm trying to cut you off at the pass. But I just want to comment that, you know, looking at the report today more speaks to Jim's nomenclature and really his process that is quite different than mind over markets and that's not to say that all the found the principles of the book aren't still relevant and I think that's why it had a second printing in 2013 there's very the few trading books the basic get principles, a second edition. Basic principles are time price and volume they still remain very important right that has not changed at all okay and another question um Will you be able to address critical success factors to getting the most out of taking the mastery series? For example, Window Trader Blue is a must, or if Toss Monkey Bars will still permit you to follow the immersion process, that sort of thing. And if I may, Jim, I'm just going to jump in on this one. We use Window Trader, and we like it. But we also say, hey, we all are different. We all have personal um, preferences. It's a very individual, personal choice what platform you choose to use. And it also, let's face it, you can drive to work in a Beamer or you can drive to work in a, a, a Volkswagen or you can drive in a Buick. The point is, it still gets you where you're going, but how much is in your budget to, you know, expend that monthly cost, you know, because we want to stay in the game. And that's why we put the market profile platforms under resources and we developed a list for you with links so that you could look at all your um, selections and make a choice that's best for you. And that's given your experience level and your success in trading and your budget and you know other things. So uh, the other thing about the critical success, I would say that you know, we never want it to be lost that the mastery program is an advanced course, very advanced. And, you know, just like college, you don't, or even high school, you don't come into, you know, physics 501. And, um, you know, usually you've got prerequisites to attend that program. And we don't make prerequisites because we recognize people's budgets and we don't want to exclude anyone from an opportunity to learn. But, but let me let me kind of comment on it. I, I'm, I'm somewhat uncomfortable with your analogy. And I'm uncomfortable with it because if I'm going to take the physics class, um, it's important that I do have the background because it's like I can go up a learning curve. I can take physics 101, 102. They have a, a way for me to advance my education. The What a trader is faced with, if somebody decides to be a trader, there is no ladder. There is no process that allows you to, you know, to keep, compete only against those that are on your skill level. When you become a trader, the only person you can compete against is the best in the world. It's the only place your order goes. It goes to a free market. It's seen by everybody in the world. 
there are no, there may be people advertising beginners courses, but most people, remember I had a discount trading firm for some period of time. Most traders burn out within a few, a few weeks. Um, and when we do this course, one of the things that we decided early on, for a trader to have any kind of opportunity to compete, we have to teach at an advanced level because that's where you have to start in the market. I'm, I'm sorry, but that's just, that's how I see it. And that's why it's important. And that's why we've struggled so hard trying to think how do we present this information? It's very complex information. And as you see now, I'm going more and more towards, towards chunking, being able to, you know, to look at the, at the thing and, and have a better understanding of how these interrelationships fit together. That's what experience and complexity is about. Anyhow. I, 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 I agree with that. And I don't think um, we're, I think we're in agreement because my point is there are things they can do. And, you know, obviously the field of vision lays it all out. And now you have A to Z and you can build an outline or a framework on which to increase your learning through, you know, kind of like putting in an outline and going to the member site and, you know, using the search tool. And we're going to go over this this afternoon and drilling down to different concepts, whether it's poor highs or lows, excess, prominent points of control, the revisiting, repair of poor structure, on and on, trends, gaps, so uh, multiple different time frames. But, you know, we also say, hey, some people don't want to, you know, spend that money. So we have so much content once you're in the mastery program you are a JD member and we give it all to you so it's not as efficient it may take you more time it's not as packaged up as nicely and easy but it's doable so it's again a personal choice uh, and I hope that addresses that well all the critical issues I mean I mean machine the machine and the platforms are one thing I mean I did this I did this with a uh, um, with a pen and pa paper for a lot of times when I first started trading, I mean, it's, it's all we're looking at the profile. It's just thirty-minute bars. Um, you know, you can you can do this on a piece of graph paper, paper pretty easily. I did it. Julia so. had it done on graph paper that would cover her. Uh, uh, there was like wallpaper in her where she lived. She had so yeah. many of them. Well, because I was using Excel, and I would just make a composite profile at the time. I hadn't gone to mind over. I hadn't gone to a Jim Dalton seminar, which was. Uh, a little tough for two years trying to get there with the money, but um, I had and the when composite she got profile. There, she all the cookies. <laughs> and I was aghast that you weren't doing anything really in the book, and I had been doing it for two years. But that's okay. That's how we learn. Um, but let's go back to the critical mass. The critical thing is we talked about earlier. If you do, if if you do your own preparation, you'll stumble at first. You won't feel comfortable. But that's a that's such a key portion. You do it day after day after day. That helps to build the routine. That helps to get you through that critical mass. Okay. Final question, please. Let, let's uh, take a stab at this one. And maybe we can get one more in. I'm interested to hear exactly what type of trades you take. You mentioned that you trade options. What type of options? Do you calculate the handle movement relative to the delta? How do you account for the theta decay? And how do you justify crossing such a large spread on the ES options market? And we have many options webinars at the mastery program. So, um, if you're in the program, you can go on the right rail. And again, we're going to go over this in the webinar tonight. And I'm sorry, Jim, I don't mean to take this over. But there are five and maybe more options webinars. And we haven't played up the options in the marketing for this current program. But we will be doing options for those traders that are interested. It's not a focus. If you don't want to learn it, no problem. But there are five options webinars. And they're probably an hour and a half, two hours each that really delve into uh, this is at the mastery site, how Jim trades options. Go ahead, Jim. I'm just saying that just, in front of you. But I don't do, I only buy options. I don't do any selling. I don't use any Greek numbers. I simply have a very simple view of the market. If the, if the market is undervalued, more than likely the calls are undervalued. If the market's overvalued, more than likely the puts are undervalued. I've told people that I used to go to, uh, he's passed on now, but Fisher Black and I used to go to, uh, to lunch about once a month and argue these things. And, Black Scholes uh, model of options. Price. Black Scholes models and everything else. Uh, Ed Thorpe, who uh, 
was the uh, first card counter in Las Vegas, and uh, also, uh, uh, you know, developed models, was an early client of, of mine. Um, I'm just not, there's certain things I don't believe in, and I, I really am not somebody that uses the models. The way I trade, Greeks. I simply look at the market, and I decide if the market is undervalued or overvalued, I then look at the option. I trade the shortest options I can, and they're simply a trading vehicle for me, um, very short term. So I'm not too worried about the other information. All right. Okay. Let me Tim. say thank you very much. Are you asking one more? Well, yeah, because this is a this is a nuance, and I want you to address. Do the gap rules are they um, relevant for this afternoon? We had a marginal gap, a two tick gap from the high of yesterday, and also just I he's very familiar with Jim's work. The gap rule is that if the market can't get to at least you know pretty similar value to the in a gap situation, if it um, if it can't get similar value the odds of a move in the direction of the gap later in the session are higher correct Correctly so stated. do they approve would you say his um, assessment with the gap rules even though it's a two tick gap would you agree with um or oh yeah it certainly has a this certainly has a potential to rally this afternoon i don't know if it does or not but you got higher that you got higher value the market's been grinding lower it's trading off of another market um certainly has that potential. But understand, we're in a trading environment. There's nothing going on in this market. You know, it's not going to conform to nice rules. But, you know, like I said earlier, I wouldn't have gone short because of the tempo going down. You know, then it went back up. Now it's back down. There's just sometimes you say, this is not a healthy environment. Thank you very much. Joy, well, I'm going to say well, thank okay. you. Okay, one, one, this is three people, okay? Is this a breakout of balance and fail? For the three-day balance, the technical definition of is, a breakout and fail of the three-day balance. It, it is. It certainly has that. It certainly has that potential. Now, you may need you may need another day to see how it works, but it certainly has that potential uh, in there, and particularly with the uh, the trade down here. And this is what I'm saying. When the you have one, point of, of these, control down here. I'm in a point of control, very fat down there, you know, and. Uh, it's certainly a possibility, but and sometimes it takes more than one or two days. Uh, when it got back in here today, you know, put the trade on, monitor for continuation. Um, if I would have gone short this market and monitor for continuation, um, I probably would have lightened up, and I might not still be there just because it's such an uncertain period, and I have no requirement to be in a market. Mm -hmm. But it certainly has the potential, and I'm going to look very closely to see what happens the remainder of this day and tomorrow. With the fat, Thank you. fat area above, you mean? You're going to, well, you're going to look very closely, but we also have to navigate the prominent, you know, the point of control up there in the anomalous structure. Well, it's, it's a, this whole market, this so on, trying to make science out of this market is very difficult. It's a very low confidence market dealing with tremendous amount of uncertainty. There is no commitment. I don't see anything other than very short-term traders on both sides of the market. So it's not like, okay, you looked above and you failed, and here comes the other time frame in. I don't see it in here. And I'm not going to try and make something out of something that's not there. I'll take a look tomorrow. I'll look a look. It's a possibility. Um, see how we finish up. See how we trade tomorrow. Um, but again, it's a low confidence environment. We did look out of value. There was out of balance. balance to the upside. There was no follow through, but there's no real selling and value is higher. Thank you very much. Tim, thank you very much. Appreciate your patience. We all do. And um, also, you know, the a lot of the questions that we're getting here, and I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but, um, you know, on Monday we start the two daily reports and the chat. So, you know, your questions about individual days, situations, the recap of the day, these things are going to be covered in the report, the two daily reports. So our work really gears up and um, hopefully your support and the questions that you have will be answered throughout, you know, these two daily reports. So fear not. And um, if anyone 
has any questions that you need answered, please know the door is open, the lines are open, operators are standing by, and uh, we'd be happy to help and we, you. We do have a question and answer on Saturday, don't we? Yes, we, you know, yes, we have tonight's, and that's in your email too if you look at it with the report that was sent last night and Sunday night. Um, we have the webinar with me to talk about content. I'm happy to address any of Jim's uh, approach questions. And uh, that's at 4.30 Eastern today. And then we're going to have a two-hour question and answer on Saturday at noon, you know, hopefully to um, help out our um, European friends over there who, you know, that'll be a respectable hour for them and people will have time. So, um, yes, just check out upcoming webinars at jdaltontrading.com under webinars and you'll see what we have going. Okay, and thank you, everyone. The questions are phenomenal and appreciate that. Before we go, I would like you to go back and focus more on the early part of today's presentation. Because um, all the, the questions came with so much detail at the end. But if, you, if, if you're not currently successful at trading, think about the broader discussion we had today. Think about the rules base. Think about complexity. Those are huge issues. Mm -hmm. Getting a handle around those issues make a lot of these other smaller issues uh, seem very minor. Thank you again. All right, great. Thank you, Jim, and thanks for that reminder. We'll have this recording posted uh, in a couple of hours. It'll be on YouTube as well, and we'll see you back here at 4.30 p.m. Eastern today. Okay, so thank you, everyone. Have a great uh, rest of your day wherever you're at. Bye-bye.